Everybody else is going to do a bit as well. Oh, thanks. Good job, Phil. There are five elephants in the herd, and caring for these three-ton animals is a big job. You come straight in in the morning, and you're straight into hard work in here, you know? It's really quite tough. You don't get any time to kind of warm up. Be nice to work in another section where you drive around in the morning and do check, you know, give you a chance to wake up for 20 minutes. You just get that bit as well, mate. Ah, oh, we haven't even started on the satisfaction bit yet. It's going to be really, really satisfying later on. About, about half past ten. That's going to be... Come on. It's going to be really satisfying. The elephants produce three quarters of a tonne of dung and 15 gallons of urine a day. It all has to be shifted. <coughs> They've been dirty to me now. They've left this for me. There you go, bud. All right, onto the trailer. So, no, cheers, mate. I'll uh, get straight on with it. That's right, we'll put three sugars in your tea this morning. <laughs> I know one trick to this, it's not the fill your wheelbarrow. Hey, 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 fill them up, fill them up. That's pathetic. <laughs> you should say, do not fill wheelbarrow. <laughs> the be... girls that we have working here in summer fill them up more than that. They're really winding me up in there. Something willful. <laughs> He's always drawn a certain amount of pleasure, I think, out of seeing us putting the wheelbarrow up the ramp onto the trailer day after day. So it's just going to be nice, I think, to see Keith push a couple of his own up there, really. Especially when we've let the tyres down on the wheelbarrow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I helped design it. It's pretty good, I thought. It makes it a bit hard going up, but uh, I'm not fit, but they should be fit to do that. <laughs> anyway, I better get on. Otherwise, the boss will be moaning at me. It's almost a help having him here. You know, he's 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 done a bit. He's, I'm quite surprised. He's thrown himself right into it. I'm not sure, but I think this is the quickest they've ever had this house cleaned. And probably the best. Half a ton of dung later, and Keith is suffering. Is that to shut the door to go home now? Well, I think I did pretty well, actually. <laughs> I'm sure these lads are going to tell you the same. And <laughs> I think the, only thing, the biggest thing I'll get ripped for is the wheelbarrow, I suspect. I didn't fill the wheelbarrow up too far. That doesn't even bear talking. <laughs> Normally it's one barrow, one pen. But to see uh, four barrows come out of one pen, I was shocked. <laughs> see a full-grown man putting up a show like that. Yeah. It's disgraceful. <laughs> <laughs> the elephant keepers are loving every moment of this. They're hard taskmasters, and it's going to be a tough day for the big boss. Longleat's two Western Lowland gorillas, Nico and Samba, have been together all their lives and have lived here on Gorilla Island for 16 years. But now there's a problem. For the past five weeks, Nico, the silverback gorilla, has been suffering from severe diarrhoea. Safari Park vet Duncan Williams and keeper Mark Ty have tried everything they can think of to cure him, including a special diet and different medications. A week ago, Nico started a new treatment to combat an intestinal infection called Ballantidium coli. At first, he showed signs of improvement, but today Duncan has been called in again. Last week he was solid, but uh, since then he's, he's regressed again. He's got quite um, severe diarrhoea again, unfortunately. If this Ballantidium thing, you know, becomes a blank, I think the, the next things on the list really are things like tumours, which, um, given his age, is, is sort of high, slightly higher up the, the list than it may be uh, if he was only 20. Hi, Mark. Hi, How's things then? Not that good. No. No. Really, really loose again. Is he taking these new tablets OK? Then? Yeah, he's taking those fine, no problem at all. Um, but I say that, you know, the last few days it's just been really loose, really watery. Not, not much progress at all. He's dragged out that straw through. Hey, mate. Hi, boy. Mark has been giving Nico medicine in his food every day, but it's hard to tell if it's working. 
I think, you know, it's a two-week course anyway, so I suspect it will take a while to, sh to have an effect. I think, it's, you know, the positive thing, he's, he's, you know, he's so good at taking the tablets, that's... Oh, God, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I mean, without his sort of faith for taking these things, we'd be right Stuck. out of the creek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If the current medicine doesn't work, Mark and Duncan face a very tough decision. If we don't get any response now, we'll have to knock him out and, you know, examine him internally with the uh, use of a scope. We'll, we'll look at his upper intestine through, you know, go down through his mouth and look at his uh, lower intestine from the other end as well. An endoscopy is the only way to tell if a tumour is the real reason behind Nico's illness. But at 42, he's an old gorilla. At his age, an anaesthetic could be fatal. He's much, much worse this week than last week. I suppose, yeah, you've got to start thinking of your options and I suppose knocking, knocking him out and doing some form of scan may be an option, but then there's a big risk in that. Basically, because of his age, he might not wake up. And the fact that he's ill already, you know, it's, it's just a, a, a big risk. It's not just Nico's future at stake. He and his mate Samba have lived together for over 40 years. If, for instance, we should lose one of them, obviously we're going to have to find a home for another or see if we can get another gorilla here to go with it because obviously it wouldn't be very fair to keep one on its own. It's impossible to walk away and switch off. You just don't, plain and simple. You, you, you worry about it when you go home. You, you know, you, you're racking your brains, you just don't turn off from it. It's not a nine to five job. Privately, I'm not that optimistic. You know, no, nothing at all has really made any difference so far. So, you know, I don't know. For Mark especially, it's an anxious time. For now, Nico is ill, but stable. We'll be following his story later in the series. Most of the 114 rooms at Longleat House are open to the public, but some are strictly out of bounds, like this one. This is Lord Bath's private apartment. But I've had a wonderful invitation to come up here this morning and meet Lord Bath and find out a little bit more about him. Good morning. Hello. How are you? I am well. Good. I, I have to say, before we look at anything else, I just love your desk. Well, it's in my sort of order where I can find <laughs> things, but... <laughs> but no one else can. No one else, yes. <laughs> but all. it's just the most amazing design as well, isn't it? Yes, and it was made from a, a tree that had come down in the big hurricane we once had here. And um, it's a bird oak and it can only be used for furniture, but it's wonderful for that and not good for anything else. Now, what, what's, what's the main thing that you're working on at the moment? The main thing is the autobiography, strictly private. Right. And um, I've got about five million words through it. And that brings me up to 1989. Right. And so... I put up the first uh, uh, six volumes onto the internet. But then I met some problems of how much of the rest can I put up without getting into trouble. Right, so you're having to sort of um, slow down a little bit now, are you? Uh, I'm finishing writing it, but I'm having to pause before putting anything else up. I think it'll have to wait 50 years after the last person's dead, and oh, then it can go up. And then it can go up. Now, just, I'm just looking at these um, pictures behind you here. There's quite a big contrast. How old were you in the first picture? I should put it at probably two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, well, that's the angelic me, and it's sort of before and after living. <laughs> <laughs> And, and how old were you in the bottom one? Uh, that one, I think, was about uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Right, right. Mm. Would you mind showing us around well, a little bit? That is the centre of my life, sitting at that so desk. So this, this, this is the, uh, the, the core of it all? Yes, where mm -hmm. I'm churning out all five million words. Got to get two more million, and then I shall feel a great weight off my shoulders. <laughs> Yeah, seven million words is quite a lot for an autobiography. Mm -hmm. Now, just explain some of these pictures and things that we've got here. Well, that's back in Eton days in the um, boxing team. Um, Where this, are you? Um, at the back there. This one. Yep. Yeah, so you always had a very good head of hair. Oh, always, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, were you rather good at boxing? 
well, not bad, anyway. <laughs> and it went and on he, into the army, too. And you are too. boxing again. So this was in the army, was it? Yeah, th that's in the army. So was the army a career? No, it was national service. There was a, many a laugh to remember from it, but I never had the feeling that I wanted that to be my life. No. And I was always really looking forward to getting out and on to being an art student. So did, what, what happened? You went to Eton and... and well, then two then years the in army? national service, then uh, three years at Oxford, and then um, painting. Painting. So you went to art school? I went to the sort of art schools in Paris where you just walk in and when you want to go to another one, you walk out and go into the next oh, one. Wonderful. And was this, because the, the, this is a very um, typical of um, your technique yes. now, isn't it? Because I build and it up sculpturally and then start adding colour right at the end, and that is the technique that I've developed. And what about music? You, uh, you've um, been a big fan of music. Well, I, uh, in the sort of 60s and the folk song singing, I sort of got into it then and learnt to play the guitar a little and enough for, to make a record when Des O'Connor heard a song and been doing it one on television. He said, have you done really? any more songs? And, um, and uh, is that, that's the album yes, there, Yes, that's the it? album that came out. And how did you get to number one? It died a quiet <laughs> death. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love... Can we hear any of them? Well, I'll just... Um, Sing what you straight out that? some. That's, uh, that, that's, that would be very exciting. Well, Serenaded the, by Lord Bath. <laughs> <laughs> the um, I play the host. That was the title track. Yeah. And um, well, uh, I, I better put the words in front of me if there I'm going to do it. Um, Is that, that the right one? Yes. Okay. I play the host at a table spread with the finest of things that the world has bled. I always saw that they'd claw for more. But the joy I toy is their daily bread. And now that I know they thieve and fight in the shaded glades of the secret. Safari Park boss Keith Harris has gone back to the floor for a day as a junior elephant keeper. He's been hard at it for over two hours now and Andy Hayton, head of the Elephant House, is giving him no respite. It's one thing them telling me what they're doing, it's another thing seeing it and doing it. So as you can see, the sweat's pouring off me this morning. Not enough. Not enough, he says. <laughs> I feel like something off the chain gang. With the house scrubbed down, it's time to give the elephant some individual attention. Oh, thank you. Do you want to do yours, mate? The best way is to wrap it round in your hand. Give it a good going over. Like all the elephants, Michaela's tusks are cleaned every morning to prevent infection. Almost when your thumb around. It's pretty clean, actually. Tusks are elongated incisor teeth. They're used for digging, foraging and fighting. I've always had a quite an affinity with the elephants. They're lovely animals and you can actually build up a relationship with them, which I think is nice. Everybody else tends to get in their vehicle and drive around and check their animals. Or they're in pens and they can just stick their head over the gate. But with these, there's a, you know, a whole routine to do every day. Probably the most physically attached job in the park with all the animals. It's taken Keith the best part of the morning to finish the mucking out and grooming. Valley foot. But before the elephants can go out, they must be washed. Looks like a happy little cherub in his work, doesn't he? <laughs> Not putting a lot of effort in. That's true, yeah, I'm used to grooming horses and elephants are a little bit, you can brush harder. I'm in trouble. Didn't get the muddy bit off there properly. And I didn't call him Mr. Hayton. <laughs> uh, Sir, Mr. Hayton. <laughs> Being a junior keeper is hard work, but it wasn't always like this. Many, many moons ago, we didn't concentrate so much on the skin care. So in the mornings, it was a case of letting them out, clean out, and that was it. Animal management over the years, obviously, thankfully improves. So, you know, a lot of this that we've done this morning is, is down to care for their skin, checking their teeth. So it's overall better animal management, but it's sometimes slightly harder work. But at the end of the day, the, you know, you've got 
fitter and healthier elephant, so that's great. Just letting the sweat dry off. I didn't want to splash the elephants. I think it's going to be a very important phone call. I arrive at the office and he's going to have to shoot off midway through the day, probably. I can't see him doing the whole day. I'll go along with that. <laughs> Keith has been back to the floor for half a day now. He's exhausted, but the elephant boys still have plenty of work for him. Well, we're as close as we can get to these incredibly shy antelope that are actually called oryx. And they're special because they're so very rare. Tim Yeo is head of New Area, and I believe we've got a messy job coming up, Tim. That's right, Ben, or at least you have, Ben. Yes, once a month we have to check all the animals in the park for internal parasites. And so I'm afraid you have to don the gloves and the utensil there and pick the dung up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Well, I'll be doing that a little later, but first we've got lots more coming up on today's programme. It's all change up at the Hippodrome, and the sea lions are in party mood. I find out how every picture tells a story. And Keith Harris is kept hard at work with the elephants, but will he last the whole day? Tigers, the largest and most aggressive of the big cats, have prowled the safari park since 1976. There are currently three adults here. Kadu, Shandy, a rare white Bengal, and 16-year-old Sonar. Sonar has now exceeded the life expectancy of a tiger in the wild, which is about 15 years. But over the last few days, Sonar's health has deteriorated dramatically. His keeper, Brian Kent, is very worried. He is acting a lot different, really, because normally he's very aggressive towards us, meaning jumping at the caging. I mean, he's not doing nothing at the moment. Just, just laying there, not even bothered with us. Brian is at a loss and has called in Safari Park vet, Duncan Williams. So is he eating all right then, Brian? He's uh, eating fine, there's no problem there. Yeah, but he, you know, his condition's gone down. Weight when, when, when did that sort of, sort of first notice it? The, um, the condition. I noticed it when I was. I've been off for ten days and I come back. Oh, I see. Um, come back. You know, I basically noticed it then. I mean, he's certainly breathing quite fast there as well. He's struggling to get his air in and out um, compared to the others. I mean, they're sitting quite. He wasn't nice. like that the other day. I think we're going to have to get him up. I'm a bit concerned about his breathing, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it's a bit fast, isn't it? Sona. Heavy. Sona, come here. Sona, here. It's a symptom Duncan hasn't seen in Sonar before, and it's set alarm bells ringing. Well, I suspect his, his chest has probably got quite a bit of fluid on it. I think that's the problem. I don't think it's going to be an infection like a pneumonia or something like that, because he would be off his food. He's still eating quite well. Um, but uh, uh, this difficulty in breathing is probably caused by just excess fluid in, on his lungs. If too much fluid builds up, it could cause heart failure. I think we might put him on some diuretics, really, see if that helps his breathing. I think the ideal situation would be to get a blood sample, but I think when his breathing is bad as that, it may be quite, um, All right. quite risky. Uh, we'll try him on the diuretics and, um, you know, reassess it, see how, he, see how he responds after a few days of that. Right. Diuretics are drugs which help expel fluid from the body they will have to be added to Sonar's diet. You see his back, you can see the humps of the spine, the vertebrae, so he has lost a lot of condition. But uh, walking around with his mouth open, he's just trying to get air in and out. He normally wouldn't have open his up. I think he's, he's under quite a lot of distress, really. The diuretics will take time to work. All Duncan can do is hope Sonar's condition doesn't get any worse. the new area of the safari park with head of section Tim Yeo and we're about to do a spot of sample collecting for the oryx. Tim, why are we actually scattering food? Well Ben, just really to stop the oryx uh, in the yard so that we can, we can collect these dung samples. And why, why are we collecting the dung samples? Well we need to, we need to test for internal parasites and that's the way that we, we, it's actually 
done is to send the, the, the samples away to a lab and, uh, and they can count how many eggs per gram within the, the, dung, the, the dung sample and you know, they, they can tell then on the number of eggs as to whether we need to actually chemically treat the animals. Okay, do you think that's about enough food to keep them here? I think that's great, yes. Yes, we okay. don't want too much, do we? Are we OK yeah. staying in the yard when they come out? No, now we need to move back into the yard here okay. in safety here. Okay. OK, so we'll do that. So Stuart's going to let them out. Stuart, can you go ahead, please? Yeah. Great, so if we come back behind here... That's it. So yeah. why do we have to... Is it because they're shy or is it because they're dangerous? Uh, it's because they're dangerous. I mean, they're shy as well. Right. But uh, we, we certainly don't want to be, ha you know, sort of in a situation where we've got nothing between them and us. Right. I mean, we're, 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 we've put ourselves into a safe area now. OK, so that's the first, that's the first door open now. That's so right, the first door. How quickly yes. do you think they'll be before they come out? Well, I think what we're going to have to do is move back. Let's give okay. them some space and just I move think, back. I think we have to move back about this way a bit. Is it just, again, they're quite shy animals, aren't they? So exactly. They get easily spooked, do they? Exactly. And I mean, as you, you know, as you can see, I mean, I don't know if you can see there, she's, yeah. we, we can see her in the box. So she can sense that we're actually out here and perhaps... Exactly, she knows out. we're here, yes. So even yes. though there's food down, they're not, they're not going to be enticed out just yet? No, they, I think the trouble is that they know we're here. Right. And yeah, Stuart just went yeah. in with a, a kind of wooden shield almost on his arm. That's right. Well, well, look, there's one coming oh, out, wow. which is Look good. at their horns. Yeah. Is that... See, the thing that I, I find really fascinating is that you say they're dangerous, yet the horns go backwards. So how, how, could, they, how could they kind of spear you with those? That's right. It's very deceiving. And, uh, and they, um, they actually can, they can put those horns in a forward-facing fashion, the tips, in seconds and they literally will lower their head, you know, and they'll literally just sort of go down like this and, and in, in a split second. And I mean, oh those, those horns, um, you know, will, will, will go straight up through you. They'll kill leopards, you know, these things. I mean, that they, is just incredible. And they're such gentle looking, looking animals. Well, they are, they are gentle looking, but on the other, on the other side of things, you know, they can be extremely dangerous. Are they, are they endangered species? They are an endangered species, yes. I, I, I mean, I think there are far more in captivity than there are yeah. uh, in the wild. So, I mean, they, they would, they've been sort of hunted I can, to I can almost see it. Have, If you just have a look, that one's actually just doing some droppings, just oh, yes. over there, a nice yes. big pile. Do you yes. think that's it? Can we, can we move a bit closer? To we, we can move a bit closer Great. to them now, yes. That's okay. right, yes. Can, can we let, get, get Stuart and Patrick Stuart, them can, out? can you go ahead and let them out, buddy? Thank look, you. look at this, the shield he has. <laughs> That's it's just right. incredible. I mean, that's just for protection for Stuart. Right. I'm going to put my glove on, especially for the collection process that we're about to, we're about to do. So thank you very much, Tim. I'm off to collect some dung, and then it will be sent off for testing. The safari park's two hippos have their own lakeside house called the Hippodrome. Despite its superbly appointed waterside location, Spot and Sonia have snubbed their apartment, preferring to spend their days and nights in the lake or outside in the open. There's a plan for the unused residents, and Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner is overseeing it. Because the hippos don't use the house very much, we're going to double adapt it. Uh, we're going to turn it into a sea lion holding pen. And then in emergencies, if we need to catch a hippo, we can still use it for hippos, but mainly it's now going to be for sea lions. The hippos share their water hole with a colony of six Californian sea lions who are free to swim around in the half mile long, 30 foot deep freshwater lake. At the moment, the sea lions have nowhere to go when the keepers or the vet need to treat them or when they're having pups, which is where Ian's plan for the Hippodrome comes in. But first, the fence needs to be adapted, as the gaps are small enough to contain the hippos, but the sea lions could easily swim out. Before work can begin, the lake has to be lowered. The water is released into the River Froome, which will lower the level of the lake by two metres. With the lake partially drained, work can begin. But it's a dangerous job. Spot and Sonia are suspicious, and although they may look harmless, in their native Africa, hippos are the biggest killers of man. Ian Turner keeps guard. Where he's actually working now is where they tend to go 
obviously with the noise he's making, that'll probably keep him away. But just to be on the safe side, you just got to keep a little bit extra eye on the hippos to where they are. Hippos are the dangerous because on land, um, if you get in between the water and land, they get frightened by anything, even if it's not by you, by somebody else, they will literally run straight to water. If you're in the way, they won't go round, they'll go straight through you into the water and that's where it becomes a danger. With the welding work finished and the lake refilled, it's a big day for keeper Mark Ty, who has to train the sea lions to find their way in and out of the enclosure. But will they play ball? He and his assistant Abby are hoping the lure of food will be enough to get them inside. Sea lions are naturally inquisitive and they come over to see what all the fuss is about. Celia, doorway. With the offer of fish, their appetites get the better of them and they swim straight in. Yeah, no raid in the bucket, you. Good girl. Yuki, come on. Aussie? No, manners. Mark's delighted. It looks like the hippodrome could really come in useful for the future well-being of the park's sea lion colony. If they're this calm about coming in here now, you know, with more practice, I don't see any reason why we, sh we shouldn't be able to get them to come up the ramp and be able to sort them all out within the house if we have to. Yuki, good boy. <laughs> Embarrassment of riches, eh? In the past, we've never had any facilities where we can shut them in. I mean, should there be any any problems, because they've just been free out in this lake and, and no, nowhere to put them, at least now, if we can keep them coming in, if we every morning we do their tablet fishing here, and every morning they come in, should there be a problem with any of them, we can shut the door and the vet can have a proper look at them. East Corridor, one of over a hundred rooms in the house, and like all of them, it's absolutely stuffed with magnificent paintings, furniture and antiques. Now, Longleat's archivist, Kate Harris, has the daunting task of cataloguing every single item in the house, Kate. I can't, I can't believe you look so calm or that you ever managed to get home. That's very kind of you to say that. <laughs> now, I'm really surprised that things haven't been catalogued before. The more major items have been catalogued. It's a question of how fully and how accurately. The more trivial things, of course, we really have to work very hard on to make sure it's as complete as possible. And why is it important to have a record of everything? I mean, they're here, aren't it's they? basic collections management, good housekeeping, insurance, all those issues depend on us having a complete, accurate, up-to-date, and of course now computerised inventory. Absolutely. So you're doing paintings this morning, yes. you're out with your torch. What yes. are you actually doing with your torch? I'm checking that the descriptions are absolutely right and the transcription of every inscription on a painting is accurate down to the last full stop. Because uh, have they been inaccurate in the past? Have you, have you catalogued yes. many up to now? We've had to make several changes to the way things are described. This, this painting, for instance, we're certain that now that the date is wrong. It's usually described as anglo Netherlandish school, circa 1610, and I'm pretty certain from the frock, basically, yeah. fashion is ever such a good dating tool. The fashion of the frock would indicate very specifically late 1620s, if I'm feeling confident, I'd say circa 1628, 9. You see those sleeves? Yeah. Double-tiered sleeves with uh, pain sleeves with this nice uh, white and red ribbon, double-tiered, Deep lace cuffs, yeah. The um, silk string bracelet, the morning ring there actually as well. This lovely scallop, very very wide lace collar, centred by the two colour rosette. Very reserved, tasteful pearls, nothing too flamboyant. The stiffened stomacher with a deep point and the deep side tabs. 
all point 1628. So there would not have been anything like that in 1610 then? No, hair's wrong, lovely soft ringlets are wrong, everything's wrong for 1610. Do we know who she is? We know who she is. She's Jane Shirley, Lady Covert. She married three times. And I think the mistake's been made dating that to her first marriage rather than her second. Oh, right. So once we know more about her biography, we might actually get a firm date for it. And what about this lady over here? This is a really difficult picture. Famous painter. It's by Marcus Gerard the Younger. I think it's about 1615, but we don't know who it is. It's obviously a very great lady. Look at these wonderful ropes, pearls, and that very, very fine watch at the waist with the winding key. But it's a mourning portrait. You see that there's a mourning ring with oh, a yes, death head fastened in, in that yeah. black ribbon yeah. of the breast, yes. Again, lovely lace. Look at that fine double tiered cuff. Silk string attached to the ring again. Nice pearls there. But we've we no idea who she is. She's obviously a great lady. Bizarre fashion here. Ear strings, not earrings. Isn't that bizarre? She's got all those beautiful pearls on her and a bit of black yeah. cotton through her ears. This is a fashion that um, was popular amongst the ladies of Anne of Denmark. That's the Queen of James I and VI. So how do you know who painted it? Sir Roy Strong attributed it most recently to Gerard, and nobody's queried that. There is the possibility... Sir, Sir Strong is... Sir Roy Strong is... Um, he began his career and really rose to be a famous art historian when he was keeper um, in charge of the National Portrait Gallery. And he said it's... Marcus Gerard's the right. owner. And it's just possible that it's signed. That's, that's definitely an inscription going around the sleeve in this area here. So have you, what do you have to do, kind of clean that to get the signature? How yeah, does that work? It's look very hard. You look very Some hard. sort of special photography might help us a bit. But we'll, we'll, we'll bear that in mind and have a look at the ways in which Gerard signs to see whether it could possibly be by him and signed as well. But no way of finding out who she is? Well, it may emerge. She is a great lady, so we're in hopes that it will emerge who she is. Well, if anyone out there recognises her, please let Kate know. <laughs> yes, I'd be really, really grateful. <laughs> but it is a magnificent painting. Thank you very much, Kate. It's fascinating. Up in the big cat area, Sonar's diuretic medication is being prepared. It's being hidden in lumps of horse meat, the tiger's normal diet. In the wild, tigers hunt alone and at night, preying on large mammals like wild pigs and deer and feeding off a single kill for several days. Tiger keepers Brian Kent and Bob Trollope feed the tigers about 20 kilograms of meat every few days. They also get a bite-sized snack each morning, which is when the keepers administer medicine if necessary. We, we put it in little pieces just so that um, they can actually take it and eat it basically in one go. Not Because sometimes if it's too big a piece, they, the first thing they do is shake it and shake sort of medicine out. Kadu is also getting medicine in her meat. This is a, a powder called Cinequin that is uh, actually for her arthritis. It just helps her combat her arthritis problem. Yeah. Well, this is uh, no medication in these chunks whatsoever for Shandy, but we, because she looks on forlornly when uh, we give the others theirs, we thought it was only fair to give her a little bit, so there's nothing actually in it. It also helps if she does get any problems that we can just give it to her willy-nilly. There you go. That was an extra piece. Yeah. That's it. Sonar is going to need very close monitoring. A male tiger of his age should weigh 200 kilograms, but he's seriously underweight and is struggling for breath. Bob and Brian know his future is uncertain. You know, he's a pretty he's a sick tiger, really. I mean, so it is a concern. But obviously, we know we would keep an eye on him and see how he goes. Hopefully, you know, he will improve. We'll find out if Sonar is winning his fight for health later on. There are 
over 250 deer in the park who were also under keeper Tim Yeo's care. We volunteered to give him a hand. Tim, what can we do? Well, Ben, it's a very busy time of the year at the moment. The stags are casting their antlers at the moment. That means they're the, the antlers are falling off, and we need to, to feed the, the female deer to get them out of the way. OK, so is this, is this the stuff? Can, I, can I help right. out with yes, that? Yes, you certainly can, yes. So what should I do? Just, just... If, you, if you can go over, over there about yeah. 30, 40 yards and start feeding them up Brilliant. the field. Lovely. See you in a bit, Kate. OK. Right, shall we, shall we do the lot over here? Yeah, there we are. OK. Oh. Come on, girls. So these are all females here, are they? These are all females, except for about uh, three uh, stags that are here. Um, I mean, we've got some male calves as well. Right. But predominantly, it's, uh, it, it's females oh. with followers. <laughs> Look, hold up. Just be patient. <laughs> there you are. What sort of deer are these? They're very pretty. These are red deer. And, and are those behind a different...? And, and those behind, they're, they're fallow deer, a different species there. So you keep them, keep them ma mainly separate from the males. Do you do that um, just at this particular time of year, or are they always kept separate? Um, certainly not, not all, always are they kept separate. I mean, we, what, we do it now really because we've got the public coming round and feeding. And uh, we don't. We didn't really want the while, while the stags had antlers, you know, them sort of putting their heads in the in the cars and so, things like so that. So for safety, so, really. That's right. That's right. But they seem to um, enjoy living in a herd. I mean, is that is that how they would live in the wild as a, as a sort of great herd? It is. It is very much uh, yes. I mean, these are the, both species, the, the fallow and the red, are both herd species. So they, 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 that's their their life cycle is uh, is very much you know living in, in a herd I and would mean, it would you tend to get sort of all the females together with one stag how does it work how does the hierarchy work well um i mean it, it tends to to work that the the stag during the the breeding season or the rut as it's called in the autumn um the, the stag will try and hold as many hinds as he can. The hinds are the females. Uh, the, sorry, yes, the hi hinds are the females, and he'll he'll try and hold as many as he ca he, he can. So he'll have a whole sort of breeding colony. Is that that's that right? Sort of idea? That's right. And he, but he's got, he's got to fend them off. You know, he's got to fend off other rival stags as well. So his time is he doesn't eat very much at all. Gets very thin. Um, exhausting. Absolutely exhausting, exhausting work. Yes. A bit like you me back. now, actually. <laughs> I saw you scampering this, about over there. It's absolutely beautiful. It is. A, it's a really, I really get how special friendly moment. they are as well. I know. I know. Well, they've all got the food. What, what's next? Well, Ben, uh, what's next is we've got to go and find the cast antlers. I think. Brilliant. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll stay here and feed this one because okay. we've made friends now, haven't we? Yes. Is that nice? Here, I look. Lucky girl. Ooh. Right, well, they lose the antler at this time of the year because they're really um, their testosterone level has, has dropped, mm -hmm. a bit like sap in a tree, you know, okay. going down. And, uh, and so they're not, they're not going to breed now. It's right. not their breeding time. So um, they have no further use for the antler at the moment. And, and so they cast this, they, they cast this antler fact, and then they will... Regrow it. So that, is that, in fact, there's. I think that's there's one, right. That's one right. There's, there's, there's one. We, there's one here that's been. Are we okay cast. going up to it? Yeah, we are. Yeah, they're, they're, they're going to back off. impressive looking. I can't believe we found one. <laughs> How amazing! So that am I there okay to is. pick it up? Yes, yes. There it is. That, look at that! Wow, what's it actually made of? It's quite. Well, it's it's very similar to, to bone. In fact, I mean, it it it, it, it isn't bone exactly but yeah. it's got very similar it's high in calcium right and the deer will actually will actually gnaw this so sometimes they'll they'll gnaw it to, to sort of regenerate you know or get calcium back into the system and is that i mean the ones that they've actually run away a little bit i don't think they like me very much right. but but some of them the, the the antlers are just one one round piece but yes. this has obviously got lots yes. of so what's the significance when it's got actual sort of branches off it well, as as the animal gets older, I mean, they do um, tend to to have these are called tines, these right. these points, and they they do increase in number, but um, it, it's it, I mean it's not it doesn't uh, depict you know sort of what age they are by right. the number of points. It has nothing nothing like that. Um, what about but hi hierarchy? I mean, if I'm a, if I'm a deer with that on me, does, does that mean I'm a pretty impressive? And, and strong. Exa exactly. I mean, if if you're if you are a, a healthy 
fit, um, strong stag. Um, and uh, you're pretty intelligent as well, you know, I think, and, and aggressive and able to hold the females, then you are likely to, to grow, you know, sort of larger antlers because obviously they're needed, they're needed in battle, you know, to, to uh, drive other stags away. Absolutely. Well, um, that is a very impressive looking antler. Um, I think I spotted one in the distance over there, so um, we'll go and collect it. Back up at the Elephant House, Safari Park boss Keith Harris still has another three hours to go as a junior keeper. Well, it's the dirtiest these boots have been. <laughs> I had my wife hoover the insides out this morning, get rid of the spiders. It's not been too bad, actually, better than I thought. But then, I don't think he's putting as much into it as everyone else. It doesn't look dirty enough to me. Keith's been hard at it for five hours, but gets a short breather while the elephants socialise together in the yard. Elephants communicate with their trunks and use a variety of noises. They can also emit a sound from their foreheads called infrasound, which is too low frequency for humans to hear, but will carry up to 12 miles away. This is very important to elephants in the wild for communicating over long distances. Back in the hut, Keith is being set to work. Right, if we make five piles, the first three piles, Keith, are for the three girls, and Billy and Dala and Macaulay, so they have maybe, I'd say, roughly that many carrots in right. three piles, and then Limbo gets slightly more, and then Marge gets slightly more than Limbo. Mind your fingers. Like I say, Keith, about that sort of size is right. fine. Each elephant eats around 225 kilograms of food per day. The shopping bill for the herd is over £2,000 a week. Take that box, Keith. Thank you. <laughs> Just sort of, yeah, shake it out along the floor, Keith. There's one more task to do. It's the keeper's favourite part of the day. Just about to take the elephants out for their afternoon stroll now. Let's take them out every day. It's good exercise and let them sort of grub around in the, in the woods out there. It's nice, they've been on the yard all morning, so it's nice for them to get out and about, really, stretch their legs. In the wild, elephants would walk up to 50 miles a day. There's only probably four or five collections in the country that walk elephants out now like we do. And I think we are walking probably the most amount of elephants out, out of anybody. It's lovely to see the elephants being able to be elephants. They're up playing in a big mud hole up there. Pleasure they get from it, and it's, it's lovely to watch it. And you're out in the open air, because I, I, you know, I do spend a lot of time in the office. So it's just nice to be out and about. An hour later, it's time to head back to the house. See the state of them now, doing all that scrubbing I did this morning. It's disheartening, but uh, of course they thoroughly enjoy it. So now it's good. It's really enjoyable. Okay, being forward. Go. With all the elephants safely back inside, Keith's return to the floor is finally over. Keith done very well. Hats off to Keith. Hats off to Keith for coming up. Yeah, I've, thoroughly, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it actually. I must admit, I have. It's nice. I enjoyed walking out with them, except they did walk a bit fast. I mean, I think that could be slowed down slightly. Yeah. <laughs> I've got the makings of four very good elephant keepers. <laughs> I, I, I will be honest. I, no, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. <laughs> we got the makings of a good boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're a, a bit more fine-tuned. I'm sure we'll, we were there. <laughs> Earlier in the programme, we were following Sonar, the Bengal tiger. He's been suffering from breathing and digestive problems, which the vet has been treating. Bob Trollope is his keeper. How's he doing now, Bob? Well, he's made a good recovery from that. Um, it's obviously something that we've got to check daily. So, you know, it's, it's a worrying thing, but 
Yeah. Let's get on bed. It must have been really worrying times for you. Yes, it was. You know, it's, we don't like any of our animals being ill, but it was particularly with something like this. Well, let's hope he, he continues to get even better. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Coming up on the next animal park... Thrown to the lions. It's feeding time for the pride. I think Longleat actually buys about 40 tonnes of meat a year for the lions. That's the equivalent of about two nine-stone people a day. It's a jungle out there, and the monkey nuts are on me. You're so cheeky. And Rocky is in a critical condition after being bitten by one of the bull camels. Because of his age, if he gets a second infection, it could be fatal. That's all to come in the next programme. See you soon. Biggest party for 50 years, and you're invited. There are four days of special programs, events, live music, and two massive concerts at the Palace. So celebrate with the BBC from the 1st to the 4th of June, Jubilee 2002. We're bringing the music to the party.